Yeah, I mean, seriously. In my lifetime, the average NFL score is like 26-23. Most games are won and lost with four minutes to go. Right. I don't, I mean, obviously I assume that this is the, we all assume this is the responsibility of the head coach, and apparently it is the responsibility of the head coach. But I, I don't know why I just, in my mind, I imagine there was someone who just stands next to the coach is like, hey, uh, we only got two timeouts left. I like, don't, but I don't. That, that feels like a, a, yeah. a small role, but also very important, especially when you're looking at, Oh, and nine and challenges. Yeah, like, I, I, that I, seems like a very big responsibility. I, I got to figure out who it is. There's there's somebody else in the league that we know is a good coach that was bad with challenges. I, and I don't know who it is, but there's somebody out there. Well, my next guest just told me that uh, Coughlin's good with challenges. So it's not. I thought Coughlin was bad. Somebody that's good. I mean, Tomlin obviously knows what he's doing. He's been to two Super Bowls. Yeah, but I mean, there's so much going on when you're a head coach. It seems like it would be smart to have one, someone just standing there uh, helping you, you know, take that off your plate. Finally, after leading the Celtics to win over the Raptors last night, we talked about this a few minutes ago, Kyrie Irving made some reveals in the postgame. Unprompted, Kyrie said he called his old teammate LeBron and wanted to apologize in talking about uh, leadership. So this is what he had to say. I apologize for being that young player that wanted to everything at his, you know, at his fingertips, and I wanted everything to uh, be at, you know, my threshold. I wanted to be the guy that led us to championship. I wanted to be the leader. I wanted to be all that, and you know, the responsibility of being the best player in the world and leading a team is something that's not meant for many people. And Brown was one of those guys that came to Cleveland and tried to really show us, show us what it's like to win a championship, and it was hard for him. And uh, sometimes getting the most out of the group. It's not the easy, the easiest thing in the world. Don't kid yourself. LeBron was just super talented when he went to Miami with all those veteran guys. That's when LeBron became political, more outspoken, took on challenges. Really, I thought became a leader. Then when he went to Cleveland, he took and he ad- admitted it. LeBron admitted, "I took all those things I learned from Pat Riley and D Wade, of course, and I took them to he Cleveland." He took the championship blueprint. And brought it to Cleveland and, most, and won a championship And that there. was leadership. And, and he needed to go to Miami yeah. and get that new environment and be around an organization that already had a championship and, and, and championship level players yeah. and ownership and to, uh, leadership. That's what, that's really what it is. But to me, this comes down to Kyrie, even though it's kind of like a another little backhanded jab at, at his team there. Right. Expectations change things. You may think you're a leader. You may think that you're uh, you're on the right path and that uh, you know everything or you know what it takes to win a championship because you have one. And then it, you become the guy. It's different. And you realize, oh, this is this is really how it how it works. It actually is all my fault at the end of the day. And that's what I think happened here. Well, it's you. He maybe he's a leader when he's not the guy. Well, I always said with LeBron, the great thing about playing with LeBron, Kyrie could just drive to an arena, drop 24. And when the game was over, all the media came and said, LeBron, your thoughts about the game, and Kyrie could slide out the back door. Right. It's very easy to play with LeBron because, you know, Michael Jordan had this. Scottie Pippen could just play. And the microphones all went to Michael Jordan, and Michael Jordan had to sit up there and answer every question. And the minute Michael left, Scottie was no less talented. But do you remember what happened to Scottie? He had an issue with Phil Jackson. Scotty was never the great leader. Scotty was a great talent. And he was allowed to be, you know, games were done. People cared about Michael. Michael's opinion made the headline. Scotty could play and leave. When Michael left and Scotty had to be the guy that answered the questions, he melted down. As a team, you still have the same level of pressure with, you know, when you have someone like LeBron or MJ on your team. Yeah. But it's the the spotlight, the focus, the answers, like you said, are not on you. And that's what I think happened here. He, he, he has those expectations now. It changes yeah. things. Drive with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Lie News. Well, he played for over a decade, and you remember him as a Steeler when he entered the league, then as a great New York Giant, spent a little time with the Jets. Plaxico Burris, who is in Los Angeles today, coaching the NFLPA Collegiate Bowl. Future NFL players take on the field against college football all-stars. Um, good to have you in, man. How you doing, man? How's everybody? You know, you know it's funny. I, I, you know, when, when we talk about the games this weekend, let's talk Rams and Saints. So you've played in the Superdome. Uh, right. It's it's really loud. Right. You've also played in a game that was so cold, you told me you had to rub your body in Vaseline. <laughs> Would you rather play in absurdly cold conditions, Plax, right. which you've done, uh-huh. or would you rather play in a stadium you can't hear your 
audibles and can't think. What's a bigger disadvantage, crowd or weather? I think any receiver would love would love to play indoors versus outside. Yeah. I mean, going up to Green Bay and playing with minus 16, nobody knows what that feels like. Tell, tell us what it was like. Tell my audience. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's, I, I think that the water was freezing on the sideline in like less than 10 minutes. That's how cold it was. It was like minus 23 wind chill, minus 16. And it's so cold that you can't believe it. I mean, you, you had a great game. Oh, yeah. Me and Eli go, on, go, out, go, out, and go out on the field and warm, warm up two hours before the game, and there's nobody in the stadium. You, you, would, you would not have thought that it was a football game that day. That's how cold it was. And you rubbed Vaseline on your body. Uh, yeah. I, I basically had on an adult onesie. <laughs> Underneath my uniform. <laughs> and it, you ended up having a, and I, I would imagine, uh, so it didn't affect your performance. Did it affect your routes? But did it affect when you got hit, it hurt more mentally? Did it Because you had a good game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, you can't prepare to go playing minus 16 degrees because those conditions really don't exist. Anywhere else. Yeah, except in Green Bay, but. Uh, we needed to win that game, and we did. Yeah. And in terms of, let's say you're the Rams and you're in the Superdome this weekend, explain this to people listening or watching on our show. Um, you can't really audible the line. I guess a yeah. lineman could, but it's just a series of hand signals. Yeah, absolutely. I think the Rams going into this, going into this game, their offense will be basically be going off a silent count. You know, it'll be a lot of hand signals b between the quarterbacks and wide receivers because you can't hear. And they'll basically be going off a silent count all game. Is that a disadvantage? Does it does it affect it? Does it affect the running game because you don't have the yeah. uniform? It's, it's a it's, it's definitely a disadvantage for the offense because your offensive line doesn't get up, get off the ball as quickly. Okay, fair enough. Right. I don't think that affects the passing game though as much. It may affect the running game. Oh, absolutely, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, when, when you know, it's interesting when you let's let's go back let's let's go back to the Patriots. And the Chiefs this weekend. Mm -hmm. Kansas City is seen as having kind of this, you know, I mean, Cheetah, Travis Kelsey, Sammy Watkins, v Mitchell Schwartz, good offensive lineman, Patrick Mahomes, as yeah. a lot of talent. Lot of but Bill Belichick, and you faced him multiple times, right. okay? What does Belichick do to an offense? When you talk to quarterbacks, he's given through his career, right. he eats young quarterbacks right. alive. Mahomes had right. two turnovers against the Patriots. What does Belichick do defensively to slow down multi-talented offenses? It's not just about what he does to an offense. In all three phases of the all three phases of, of the game, what you do well, he takes it away from you. And you're basically just playing left-handed. You just have to go in and beat him. Because they're they're not going to turn the football over, and you you just have to go out and basically get pressure on Tom Brady without blitzing. I, I think that's one of the keys to, to winning the game. Yeah, and Kansas City definitely has the better football team, but you just can't count New England out. Did you play well against New England secondary and Belichick's defense? I did. Because I, I did, but they were basically taking away everything that I ran inside. Oh, they took away your inside oh, route. It, it was taking away everything. And it was basically uh, using the sideline as another man. So you were, you could sense they defended right. you differently than other teams. Yes, definitely. They, yeah. they they take away everything that you do well and and just make you react on the fly. That's what they do. Let's go to the Rams and the Saints. If I said to you, who's got better personnel, L.A. or New Orleans? Who's got better players? L.A. I feel the same way. Right. I I, I believe that the, uh, the Rams have more talent. But I picked the New Orleans, New Orleans Saints to win the Super Bowl at Week Eight, and I'm and I'm not going back on it. Why? Because I think they're a better football team than people give them credit for. I think they have the best defense in foot in, in the playoffs right now. I really do. You think the Saints do? I do. Um, you know, it, it's interesting when we have an interesting weekend where we have Breeze and Brady. Mm -hmm. These guys don't make all the throws. Yeah. They don't have the big arms. Mm -hmm. They're not really mobile. They're really good pre-snap. Right. They know what they're doing before the game. ball is snapped. Goff and Mahomes, uh, younger athletes, mm -hmm. want both clearly more mobile than who yeah. they'll face this weekend. Goff can make all the throws. Mahomes can make all the throws and then yeah. some. If I just told you, would you rather have and play with a young quarterback who can make all the throws 
but still takes a lot of info from the sideline mm. or play with Brady and, Brady and Breeze, who basically pre-snap, they don't need the coach. As a receiver, the talent, the youth, the arm, or the pre-snap excellence? I would take Drew Breeze any day of the week. Any day of the week because uh, watching him play over, over the last, you know, 12 or 13 years, 12 or 13 years that he's been playing, it's been legendary. I mean, look at his numbers. Look look what he's been able to do. And, and he's going to go down into one of the great, greatest quarterbacks ever play. Yeah. When you, you're in the city of New York now, you live over in, you know, New Jersey. Yeah. You got some, you know, a backyard <laughs> and deer and all that stuff. Yeah. So you have the Giants and the Jets. The mm -hmm. Jets have the Sam Darnold thing and the Adam Gase thing. Right. And the Giants have the Eli situation. Just take me through New York is a proud franchise. Right. The Mara family, I, we always say they're kind of like an accounting firm. They're kind right. of conservative. Now they got OBJ, who's right. a rock star. Mm -hmm. And now they got Eli, who they're petrified to offend. It feels like to me in the last couple of years, the Giants have lost their way. They're afraid to draft another quarterback. They kind of feel beholden to OBJ. When you were there, you were allowed to be a personality. Right. Lawrence Taylor was allowed to be a personality. Right. But you felt they were so formidable and well-run. Are the Giants well-run today? Oh, absolutely. You they believe are. that? They're, 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 they're definitely one of the top five organizations in football. I had the, I had the privilege for playing for, for the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Giants. And they're definitely... Uh, you felt they were great franchises. Yes, absolutely. Did you you didn't feel that with the Jets? I did not. Walking into the Jets, walking into the Jets building and, go, and going into a game on the weekend, your mindset was, uh, "I hope we win this week." <laughs> that that was kind of the aura of being in the building. But when you were with the Steelers and the Giants, it was, "We will win this week." Oh yeah, we will win this week. Okay, so Kansas City, New England, you'll take Kansas City. Rams, Saints, you'll take. New Orleans. Okay, so you have a Kansas City Saints Super Bowl. I yes. think that's what Vegas likes. Yes. Uh, Plaxico Burris, 11 years in the NFL. Uh, you are coaching 12. this. 12 years <laughs> in the NFL. What, what's the name of the bowl you're coaching this weekend? The NFL PA Collegiate Bowl. And it's college guys? Yeah, college seniors going into the NFL draft. Okay. Yeah. Where's that game? The game is here in Los Angeles? At the Rose Bowl. 